Well, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we have for us the uh, three portfolio managers and then Mark Froyamson, senior member of the uh, advisory board, who's also on the investment committee. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the Angel ND Catalyst 2 fund tonight, but we're going to focus on a Q&A and uh, more on the portfolio management team and what their plans are for the future and for the uh, investments in the fund. My name is Mike Shemansky. For those of you that don't know me, I run the operations side of financials, but these are the uh, brain trust that will actually be running your portfolio for you. With that, I'll turn it over to Tobin Arthur, uh, founder of Angel MD Inc. and the uh, senior uh, portfolio manager on the fund. Well, actually, I guess Charlie's the senior portfolio manager, but Tobin's the chief investment officer. So uh, how's that? Is that, was that? Would that be accurate, Tobin? Yeah, don't make me senior anything yet. I'm, I'm too young. <laughs> Um, good evening. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, and uh, we're just going to make this very casual. We're going to walk through a couple thoughts rather than doing kind of the typical, you know, big deck. What we've done over the last couple of uh, weeks and months is just do a few thoughts. And I'd like to start off. Uh, Mike, can you see my screen okay? So yes, everything's running fine. All right. Then I'm going to jump to introducing um, Charlie and Mike. And, and again, most of you know Charlie and Mike, but for those of you who don't, I like to brag about them in particular. And I can't do their backgrounds justice in the short amount of time we have, but Charlie I've known for almost 30 years. He's an iconic businessman, um, retired as a partner at Deloitte. He was actually responsible for putting together what is now known as Deloitte back when it was Touche Ross. He spent stints at IBM as an executive. He was the Dean of the Business School at the Drucker School of Business and, and, and plenty more. Um, I met Charlie when I was in college and as he retired from corporate world and the consulting world, he began to invest in companies, advise companies, did some turnaround work and has been an extremely important mentor to me <clears throat> over these years. He also, as we got AngelMD underway, ended up setting up, uh, in addition to helping with AngelMD, set up our syndicate structure and subsequently our first fund. And like any first fund, the goal is to prove that your thesis is working. And we've had some great success uh, in Catalyst One fund so far. We'll talk just a bit about that. I'm very uh, happy to have Charlie uh, working with me on Catalyst Two fund now, which is uh, sort of bigger, better. Uh, Mike Raymer, uh, similarly incredible background. I met Mike through a neighbor of mine in Seattle who was the head of Microsoft Healthcare. And when I was getting AngelMD underway, he said, Mike is the absolute best strategist in healthcare in the country. And this is a guy who uh, was the uh, healthcare advisor to President Bush, um, you know, very rarely gave compliments. So the fact that he gave Mike such a compliment was, was high order. Mike was the head of global strategy at Microsoft Healthcare, the head of global strategy at GE Healthcare. Interestingly, started his career at Puritan Bennett, which is now Medtronic, but uh, in the ventilator space. And kind of bringing it all full circle earlier this spring, set up a nonprofit to help refurbish uh, ventilators and get them back into the market to help with the shortage of supply. And uh, they got a couple hundred ventilators back into the system. Uh, similarly, very, very uh, fortunate to have um, both Mike and Charlie working with me on the fund as, as Dr. Froymson. Dr. Froymson has been a great advisor and executive with AngelMD as our chief medical officer has got an iconic background as a leader in both orthopedics uh, and has worked with countless startups and is an incredible uh, addition to the ecosystem and Mike Shemansky, who, who you guys know, so I won't belabor the Mike Shemansky story, but a great, great team. Uh, I would put this team up against any fund team, quite honestly, uh, even, you know, funds, the $500 million level, no question about it. Let me just talk just a little bit about the market. And again, we have a lot of analysis we've done. These guys know the market inside and out. Um, there's a lot of macro thesis that we look at and specifically, we really, you know, there's obviously great trends around healthcare as a macro play. I don't need to say that to this audience. You guys all live and breathe the healthcare space. So I'll save that. But when we look a little bit more specifically, more closely, you know, whether you're looking at VC or whether you're even looking at the capital markets, we think that there's a lot of fluff and uh, let's just say overvaluation in the market. Where that doesn't exist, however, is in the earlier 
um, portions of the of the venture market. We think that's where the real opportunity is. And yet it's also uh, a space where the venture, most venture firms have a very difficult time playing in the early um, phases of companies. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but we think that's a real niche. And that's why when we look at the healthcare market writ large, um, this is a space that we are particularly zeroing in on with the Catalyst 2 fund, that is seed rounds. We may do some early series A in a few cases. We also have some follow on investments we're making into some previous uh, portfolio companies, which gives us also an additional advantage there. So this is really the focus. We've taken the last several years and created a systematic way of we think de-risking early stage. And if we looked at it in three big buckets, it's really uh, about pipeline development, about the analysis, making decisions, and then what you do post investment. And we think we can stack up systematically against anybody what we're doing in each of those three categories. And by the way, part of our thesis is that most funds will talk a lot about pipeline. They'll talk even more about their analysis, that they're the smartest, you know, five people in the room, so to speak. What they won't be able to give you typically a very good answer is what they do post investment. Usually the extent of that is, oh, we sit on boards or we act as advisors, we open our Rolodex. And, and frankly, that's quite limited, even in the biggest firms. And what we do is open up a Rolodex that includes thousands and thousands of clinicians and hospital system executives, pharmaceutical executives, device executives. And we're constantly tweaking the model so that we can do each, you know, work on each of these three buckets, pipeline, pre-investment decision-making, post-investment support, doing them at scale. Now, as I said earlier, uh, you've got a hypothesis until you've uh, proven that hypothesis, it remains just that. We've had some success with the Catalyst One Fund and, and it was exactly the goal was to put some money to work. As I mentioned, Charlie uh, executed this fund, 13 investments in total, and it's tracking in, uh, incredibly favorably on a number of fronts. Now, it's still early in the game. We're only three and a half years into the fund. And for those of you familiar with venture numbers, typically you're going to see most of your write-offs in years two and three. Those are the highest years of write-offs. Years four is kind of a middle year. And you're going to see most of your bigger exits in five, six, and seven. You're going to start harvesting funds years five, six, and seven. Certainly doesn't mean that you won't have uh, companies that take longer. But when we look at the where we are in the in the, uh, the fund at this point, Mike does our mark to market analysis. Uh, our last update was we we're tracking at about I think Mike correct me if I'm wrong about 42% IRR maybe just slightly under that uh, just a little under because our original calculations were tracking end of uh, November and I updated it for year end. So since there weren't any updates or evaluation changes over that month or technically our IRR dropped to 41. But. Yeah. And, and the other thing that we look at is, you know, not just the, the momentum in the fund, but also how do you prevent the failures? You know, what can you do to identify and prevent failures as best possible? And, and there again, out of 13 companies, we've had one company at this point go under. So three and a half years into that, that's extraordinary. So by all measures that we're tracking in right now, we would be in the top 5% of all venture funds. Now the, the goal is to go is to put more capital to work. So we're going, you know, our goal is a, a 10 million fund, um, $10 million fund with Catalyst 2. Uh, we've got some space for individuals. And then in the coming weeks, we're gonna begin engaging with family offices and larger institutional investors to round out this fund. It's very unusual, by the way, for those of you, again, not familiar with all the numbers, for a smaller fund. Smaller funds have to have something else that has, ends up subsidizing them because with a two and 20 model, that is 2% management fee and a 20% carried interest model, you do the math, there's not a lot of capital in terms of the management fees. And so we have to be very judicious what we do. But again, we'll stack this fund up against uh, big and small funds alike. So I'm going to stop there. We could go on. What we like to do is make this more casual, but I want to turn it over to Mike, who will pull Charlie and 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 uh, Mike Raymer and, and Mark into the conversation. And certainly if you have questions, not only can you post them, uh, you can raise your hand and using these crazy Zoom tools and we'll, we'll call on you and, and we're also available offline as well. Mike. Yeah, exactly. So anybody that's here is free to post their questions into the Q&A. That's the best. Or the chat forum is fine as well. I will then uh, relay that to the, to the uh, panel. Or as uh, Tobin said, actually, when we're in webinar uh, right now, Tobin, so I don't think anyone can raise hand and I can call on them. But uh, just post them in there and I'll make sure that the questions are answered. Um, with that, I'm just going to kind of feed the panelists some questions that we've had uh, prior um, that uh, I know a lot of people have thought about. I'm gonna 
start a little bit with Charlie tonight. Given that Tobin is focused a bit on what we do, uh, like at the selection and post as a big part, uh, what do you think is the defining characteristic that we use when we choose these funds from our pool? And how does the network and the doctor involvement really help drive that selection process? Well, I think the uh, uh, principal thing is that uh, whether it's a product or a service, it's a therapy or a device, uh, is that there's a, a, a degree, a high degree of market uh, interest, a high degree of, of market uh, uh, addition that could come from whatever the company has. In other words, it's saleable, it's commercializable. Well, we can't make any money on it, nor can our investors unless we commercialize these, uh, these companies and get returns from them. So that's a, that's a big piece of it. The, the, the second part, I think, uh, very much so that I've looked at over the years, companies and, and the ones that we put in the Catalyst portfolio, is the quality of the management teams. The management teams uh, that are imbued with the spirit and with the understanding and the technology know-how to make not only make the company work, but to make their technology, their product, their service, their therapy that they're, that they're going to put into the marketplace, make it a winner and make it a, uh, 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 an entry that uh, is going to do do the two big things that we want to be able to do. And that is uh, reduce healthcare costs and improve patient uh, uh, outcomes. So those two things, there is a, a third piece that I've looked for with Catalyst One, and we will tend to do that with Catalyst Two, is the options for exits. And we aren't looking to build another Genentech, uh, uh, the company isn't, or, or uh, uh, a, another large device company, a Medtronic, whatever it might be, because we, we think that these companies can best survive, they can best get to market if they latch up with a larger, uh, people maybe not, won't like the word, but deeper pocketed um, uh, partner, a strategic partner that can help them build out the company and, and take it to market. Gotcha. In, in essence, uh, we don't need to hunt elephants, uh, rabbits and deer are just fine, right? Yes. So uh, with that, Mike uh, Raymer, uh, you know, you've got so much experience in terms of management and uh, the general strategy of go to market and uh, other aspects of companies. Um, what do you view as a real strength of being able to manage these companies post-investment, particularly in terms of uh, how you can leverage the network and the doctor relationships therein? Well, I think, uh, you know, first of all, Charlie brings a wealth of experience in terms of coaching the, the CEO entrepreneur, but just as critically, we're able to leverage the power of the Angel MD network uh, with experts and given specialties to assist the startup um, in uh, gaining access to uh, go to market, um, to sharpen uh, their messaging uh, that they're providing to the clinicians. Uh, we have examples of, of startups also as they go through the regulatory process of being able to assist them in, in terms of cost effectively uh, moving through the FDA approval process. We have uh, uh, um, one of our uh, initial investments was in the therapeutic space and Catalyst One, and we recently worked with them on their 1A, 1B um, strategy with regard to uh, regulatory clearance. And that was through a combination of not only our team, but really just leveraging the overall expertise of the network. So, you know, how we're different is we almost are like a private equity firm that surrounds uh, the startup with a lot of assistance and resources, uh, but without all the expense associated with that and probably through better expertise generated through our network. Gotcha. So uh, yeah, that's one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at the field before joining Angel MD is that when you look at companies like uh, the uh, alumni ventures groups or the other uh, angel networks is that it's just not a scalable solution to say that you can go in and, and manage these companies because portfolio managers need to get paid. 
Um, and so you guys as the portfolio managers would normally expect uh, more of it. We can roll out more of these funds and we can lever the network to essentially get a multiplier effect on your talents. Um, Mark, uh, Doc Froemson, how do you feel about being levered? <laughs> How's your experience been uh, working with the team and thinking about that with the network and the companies they're in? Yeah, um, thanks, Mike, and and really, you know, really appreciate all of the great comments. You know, I think this is, you know, as a surgeon, you know, I'll give you a surgical analogy, which is, you know, every patient's different, every operation's different, but they all have, you know, they all follow the same patterns and they all follow the same types of um, of processes and, and there's a rigor to it and there's a flexibility to it. And so, you know, one of the things that, that we really want to um, focus our, um, our companies on is understanding, you know, probably three things and, and, you know, there's probably a lot more, but the idea is like, make sure you understand the problem you're solving, not just the solution that you're bringing to the table, but how to communicate uh, into the marketplace and understand your customers, understand how it's going to impact the workflows, um, really know your market and be able to, to articulate so that my mother-in-law can understand it. You know, what problem are you trying to solve uh, and who's going to be happy you solved it and who's willing to pay for it. Um, and too often, you know, we see, um, or, or one of the things that we really have to work on with our leadership teams and Charlie was right. It is about the team communication skills are just so important. And often you find um, early stage companies who don't really know how to tell their story, don't know how to sell their story. Um, and so that's, that's a key skill set that we see time and time again. And, and I mentioned flexibility. We need our, um, our leadership teams, our entrepreneurs who've come to us with an idea to understand that there's lots of ideas out there. You've got to be flexible enough to fit your idea into the marketplace. Gotcha. Uh, and, then, and then the third aspect is the rigor. You know, it's just like a surgical procedure. There's rigor to this. And so people think often are mistaken in believing that, well, I've got a great idea and, the mar and you know, the market's just going to beat down my doors to come get it. Well, you know, you have to de-risk things and you have to de-risk it from you know, a realization of a product or service, can you actually deliver it? Can you deliver it to scale? Uh, can you um, get across the regulatory and the sales milestones? So there are really clear patterns that we see repeated over and over again uh, that entrepreneurs need to understand. And that's where we can, back to your question, that's what we can leverage. You know, we can see the common patterns that emerge through companies that may seem to be in very different domains, but they face the same types of, um, of challenges and maybe they need the same types of skill sets and, and that's where we can scale this. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, we have an operational question from here in here. It's uh, regarding our distribution on uh, events. So what is the distribution plan with company equity events and particular stock events? We plan all exits to be direct distributed. Essentially, we have a single investment round with the Catalyst 2 because it is an early stage fund. The goal is that any exits that are uh, created during that time are gonna be distributed directly at the time of the event. Um, we will not be reinvesting those funds. Uh, if someone wants to continue the investment structure, they're free to then take that money and reinvest it into the next of the series of catalyst funds. And that's the way we foresee this happening in the future. So by rolling out one of these every 12 to 18 months, the goal would be to always be attacking that fresh seed and, and early A environment with a brand new set of investments, which allows you to then focus on your own liquidity events and be able to do that. Um, oh, okay. Mike, if an IPO probably... occurs, no, actually, DJ, our goal is we will probably just distribute the stock directly to the extent that it's allowed. We will not be handling the cash. Um, I mean, I, I suppose if uh, if the limited partners decide, we can certainly um, vote on that aspect and, and go ahead and issue and, and sell the stock on the IPO. But generally speaking, I would rather take the stock and distribute it as an equity distribution. Does that yep. answer your question? Well, it's worth noting also, Mike, um, and hopefully it goes without saying, but we return 100% of principal before there's any yeah. um, allocation of, of carry, so. Gotcha. Um, actually, so Tobin, um, uh, you know, Mark was talking about the 
engagement with the network and well, everybody, we've all been talking about that. I, I would like to uh, ask you two questions. One, I know you were kind of discussing that everybody talks about pipeline, but I mean, I, I may be naive, but when I look at the companies that apply and that we talk to on a daily basis, I'm blown away because it seems like we have a much, much larger selection than a lot of funds and a lot of other people that uh, that are there. When people come to the pitch club events and they're not necessarily even all investable companies at that point, they may just be really early that we're bringing out because we would like people's opinions. Um, but uh, I, what is it that makes it so powerful about the size of this filter? Like, wh why do you think that we attract so much more interest when essentially we haven't even been an investment group right now? Yeah, there's two things. Um, you know, I could get into some of the mechanics of things we're doing with theaters and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the answer, the real answer, the center of the answer is our physician network. Is yeah. as our physician network continues to grow, and I can say this, and I've, I've never thought of, and I don't think anybody's corrected me. I don't think there's a single company in our network or our portfolio that we would consider, you know, one of our a strong company that hasn't come in through a trusted referral from our physician network. And as the membership of Angel MD grows, so grows the the word of, of mouth out there. And the sort of the ad, the tangent to that as well is that we're increasingly becoming a destination of first choice for these early stage companies. And we're, we still have a long way to go, don't get me wrong. Uh, we don't take anything for granted, but you know, three years ago, um, you, you know, in, in this business, you've gotta be careful about negative selection bias, which is, are you looking at the companies that can't get funded elsewhere? And our goal was to say, look, if we're gonna put a million dollars into a company, and Kleiner Perkins is offering a million dollars into that same round. We want to get to the point where the company takes our capital over Kleiner Perkins. Not that I'm picking on Kleiner Perkins, but as one of the pre preeminent firms. And as I said, I don't, you know, I wouldn't suggest we're where we want to be yet, but we're we've been moving steadily to that point, to the point where we have a, a company, and I, I won't name the names, but we have a company we're uh, going to invest in in this fund. This company came through Y Combinator. This company has got all of the preeminent sort of Bay Area attention you can imagine. And they specifically have um, asked to, to have us in the round and they will hold the round open because they want Angel MD in their round. It's they, they want that brand, they want the access to that network. So again, that's a validation to me that it's not about, it's not because they want Mike, Charlie, myself and, and, and Mark necessarily in that company. It's because they want to be backed by a network that has 10,000 clinicians in it. Gotcha. Uh, so we, DJ is uh, asking a lot of questions tonight. That's great. Thanks, DJ. Uh, so uh, how would one of you guys, I don't know who would like to answer this, but I pony it up. Uh, how would you describe your ideal capital allocation in terms of for risk management and uh, value uh, maximization standpoint? Charlie, Tobin, maybe Charlie, how do you think about it? Say that to me again, the distribution. Uh, how would you consider your capital allocation distribution? Like I, I can tell people that we have a rule that we are not gonna be investing more than 10% in any one company. We have a target portfolio of approximately 15 names with a mode distribution of around uh, 500,000 with the ability to go up to a million on, a, on the highest and best selected ones. That would be based on a $10 million yeah. fund. Um, I mean, but I what about in terms a, of- I, I, I think Mike, we got it a fairly clear understanding that in terms of investing in the individual companies, we're looking at investments somewhere between 250 at the lowest end and probably 750, uh, maybe could go to a million, but you're really constrained in, in that by wanting to get enough of a diversity of companies because I don't, I mean, we're lucky so far with Catalyst One. There's no doubt about it. But of course, you can say we picked them right and all this sort of stuff. But there's still a certain amount of luck that goes along with this. And so that's why people like to invest in funds because you get a diversity. You're ranging the capital that's deployed over a number of companies, all with at the at the get go, equal chances of success. But you know that's not going to happen. So that's sure. why I think. If, if it's a $10 million fund, 250 to 750 is probably the range, the sweet spot, 500 grand that goes into every company. I would yeah. add in there too, just in terms of allocation, you know, we're looking at basically three primary big buckets, therapeutics, device, 
and digital health. Our, our sweet spot to date has been device. Why? Because physicians have the most input, control, et cetera, over the device world. Now, therapeutics is an interesting space. It's growing um, in terms of our interest because we do think there are models that do make sense. Many models don't. You've got to be in a position to put, you know, 50 to $100 million to work. We're not playing in that game. Uh, but therapeutics is interesting. As Mike indicated, it's one of our uh, first exits is coming out of the therapeutic space. Digital health has been a space we've been uh, bearish on. We've watched it closely over the years, but there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of nonsense in digital health because it's cheap to get many of these companies going. But what is evolving is the buy side is, is evolving to where you've got big tech, you've got payers, you've got hospital systems are becoming acquirers of these companies. So if I was to guess, I'd say, you know, out of this fund, let's say roughly 15 investments, um, we'll probably see 50% in, in a device. And I would say the balance of the rest of the 50% will be just, you know, split between therapeutics and digital health. It, it may be off by a fraction. We don't have a hard set formula, but I think Mike and Charlie, correct me if I'm wrong, is that your instinct, kind of that rough distribution? I think that works. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mike, always very verbose. You got to tell him to shut up sometimes. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and um, so I had another question, Tobin. Um, when you started this fund, the firm, and you thought about physician involvement, what do you see as the benefits um, to the physicians themselves that we are levering um, in order to provide the investment uh, knowledge that we've got? I mean, the reality is, is our economic model is to leverage this network. Well, if we're leveraging a network, then you gotta be paying for, uh, you know, you get what you pay for, so to speak. So how are we paying for that involvement that the our leverage is cheaper than others? Yeah, that's a long answer uh, to do it right, but just a quick answer with, and really specific to Catalyst. I mean, we're, we're not talking about Angel MD. that's a whole um, uh, yeah. different story. But with respect to Catalyst, look, at the end of the day, this isn't a charity, we're not in this, um, for people to get brownie buttons. It's a way to make money. We want people to invest in this fund to make money full stop. Um, we have, you know, carried interest that we spread around through our investment committee and we fully expect, I mean, all of us is we're not making money off the management fee, right? None of us are taking fees off the, a 2% management fee on a $10 million fund. Let's just be clear about that. Um, the goal is for carried interest. And so we have the hundred percent same alignment as that of the investors. Now behind the scenes, Angel MD, there's all kinds of stuff we do. Warrant allocations, um, the ability to sit on boards, plug people in as advisors. And in some of those cases, we step out of the way and, and put them uh, in charge. And Dr. Macaluso, who joined us, welcome. Joe, um, Dr. Macaluso is a good example. You know, he's, he advises a number of startups. Um, he's got relationships with them and it's a two-way street. He brings companies to Angel MD that he thinks are particularly interesting. And similarly, he gets exposure and finds companies through AngelMD that he gets to plug into. So at the end of the day, it's, you know, people wanna make money. They wanna be intellectually stimulated. They wanna do some things that are fun and work with cutting edge companies. And quite honestly, I think not only do we provide all those things, I'm not sure there's certainly very many, if any people out there or groups out there that can do it, do what we're doing in, those, in each of those areas. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, Jerry asks, uh, will the network be able to invest alongside the Catalyst Fund? I'm going to give the short first answer and then allow one of you guys to fill in if you like. Um, the answer is uh, we do plan on uh, using enough due diligence and work on our side that Angel MD is expected to be the lead investor on any round. As such, it gets some uh, basically beneficial financial treatment by being lead investor in these uh, elements. But in the event that we do not take down or there that the uh, round is under allocated and really, really think that it's a great opportunity. We will open up sidecars for to co-invest alongside the fund. Um, I, I hesitate to push that too hard simply because then there's a cherry picking and you end up in the same problem that we had with some of the earlier syndicate investments that uh, Angel MD got involved with. But yes, you will be able to invest side by side. Um, as the lead investor in those SPVs, should we do sidecar, Angel MD actually gets some preferential financial treatment as well. So uh, Tobin or Mike or Charlie okay. even, anybody I'm, want I'm, to say I might add that a, a therapeutic that I'm, we're invested in, Catalyst One, uh, we were by no means 
the lead investor, but we were well thought of. I was on the, I'm on the board, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, during the uh, Series A round that they uh, put together for uh, some uh, $30 million, a uh, couple of our investors went in when called upon for the, uh, to keep their pro rata share that was available to all of our uh, limited partners, but several of those who invested the, their pro rata share, they also in, invested individually because they got a good piece of a very fast growing therapeutic exit oriented company. Gotcha. Thanks, Chuck. Um, let's think about some of these other issues that have uh, come up, if I can uh, think of uh, primary problems that people have had. Uh, Mike, one of the issues that has come up that a lot of people have asked about is, again, when it comes to the development process of companies, and I know you gave us a great case study example of the therapeutic that we were able to assist in that way. Uh, what do you feel is the pushback maybe from uh, companies in terms of taking that kind of guidance? I mean, not every company wants that the investment vehicles in them is get, looking over their shoulder and giving advice. Actually, Charlie, like maybe both you, I would, let's go with you first and then Mike, because you have the personal experience of actually interacting with people when we had a small fund. Uh, what, have, what has been your experience on that? It's been great in every single case. Uh, the biggest, <laughs> the biggest. Why, point, like I, why? Let's let's start well, with that. Well, the, the biggest tension point I think is because I'm always looking at the cash flow, and uh, uh, that to me is a mantra uh, that with early stage companies you can't burn out of cash, and so the the management of that financial side uh, and prodding them, whether I'm an observer or an actual voting board member, I. Uh, I raise that in those places. And it's generally ver very well accepted. I haven't had any pushbacks. I haven't had anybody tell me, uh, get the hell off, but uh, they know where I'm coming from. Well, it. maybe that's just because they respect you as an individual, but then afterwards they take that, and throw it over their shoulder and say, yeah, good luck with that. What is it that allows you to have more gravitas than maybe these company uh, uh, managers want to hear from somebody else? Like why do they believe you other than the fact that, well, you're right. And so I'll give you that. But is there anything else that you think that uh, the Angel MD network brings to bear that uh, gives you additional impact? Me? You want? Uh, actually, let's go with Mike. Let's go with Mike. Just give him a chance to talk here, too. Sure. I, I think the biggest evidence of the fact that uh, feedback that we give the, the startups is, is uh, respected and desired is that we also see them now come to us more readily uh, for assistance and help. Uh, so, you know, it's not just, you know, whether they take the initial feedback or not, but I think the strongest indication of the quality of support that we give the startups, they repeatedly come back to us to ask for assistance. Or, you know, can you recommend a, a, a physician in this area that maybe is in the Northeast because we're trying to penetrate that marketplace. And we would love to get some insights uh, to, you know, what practices to target, et cetera. So, you know, I think the biggest compliment has been is that not do they just take the feedback, but actually they come back to us with other questions. And that would be very difficult even for the typical PE firm to have that kind of impact because our network of almost 15,000 experts you know, really cover every nook and cranny of the country in addition to every specialty area. Yeah, Mark, hey, Mike, if I could, thanks. if I could just- I was, I was, I was gonna beg you to give me a response yeah, on that. I mean, look, the companies come to us because of who we are, right? Yeah. You know, we are a collection, we're the collective wisdom of, of the crowd of physicians and investors and, and people who have a stake in healthcare innovation and who, who want to do what Charlie mentioned, improve quality, reduce costs, solve real problems. So they, they come to us not just for our dollars, but because they know that 90% of the healthcare dollar out there, the, the trillions of dollars spent on healthcare comes because of some physician, some of our 15,000 physicians make a decision, whether it's a device or a therapeutic or digital health. 
you know, it starts with an order of a physician or a preference of a physician, maybe a health system executive. Um, you know, it's gotten a lot more complex, obviously. So we, uh, we have companies that understand that. And so when they're at a, a pivot point or they're, you know, they are looking at a market that might not be responding or a product that might not be performing exactly as they had hoped, who better to come to than our collection of experts who ultimately are their end users or influence their end users. So I don't think there's, I mean, it's really the question was like, how do we influence them? We don't even need to be heavy handed. We are a resource that's really pretty obvious to those that we select. And that's part of the due diligence process. Like I said earlier, if they're not you know, if they don't have the, the relationship skills, the communication skills, the willingness to learn, they're not gonna be in our portfolio because yeah. we need people who are gonna be responsive to us uh, and who are gonna understand that the market out there is, is looking for, you know, leadership in terms of solving problems, but not solving problems, you know, with a square peg and a round hole, but trying to understand kind of what's gonna be the right solution for, for the, the audience that's that's important to them. So, sure. yeah, I I don't I, you know I, if that is the basic thesis here, right? The basic thesis is that we're better than others, you know, or, or at least as good as others. But we would say we're better. Why are we better? Because we are comprised of the industry. We are comprised of the of the physicians uh, and companies uh, and health systems and payers who who comprise healthcare who make up healthcare, make all the decisions in healthcare. So if you're coming in as an entrepreneur with an idea for solving a problem in healthcare, boy, we have an expert in your area. Right. And they have, they have friends who are also experts. And we can tell very quickly by the quality of the conversation, you know, whether this is really something that's gonna catch on uh, and whether it's gonna get traction. And we can then because we get excited about these ideas, we can support them, you know, throughout their development uh, and market introduction phase, if, if, unless we exit sooner than that. Right. Yeah. And I would definitely contrast that to your typical angel or crowd type network uh, investments in the sense that sure, you may gain access to a Rolodex, but it's not an engaged Rolodex. Good luck actually finding an expert in that field that's going to be able to help you directly. Whereas with the engaged network that we have, we know exactly who can help you out. Tobin, would you add to that a little? I was just going to add one little example to bring this home. I mean, this is just one of many, many examples of how just the power of the network has helped these companies. We have an investment in a little, it's a mini defibrillator company. And we actually ran a couple of events. This company was a part of these events. And because of the exposure they got at these events, they got cold outreach from several European governments and military organizations asking for uh, orders in the tune of forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. This is before they even had CE mark in Europe. I mean, they were static. They didn't have a product to sell them. But the point was, you know, and they, they talk about this over and over, like they couldn't have bought that exposure that we created for them out of the gate. And that helped them to raise more capital and on and on and on. So it's just, you know, there's many, many stories and examples like that. Um, the one thing too, I was just going to add, there's a, there was a question about mechanically the investment process. And I was just to make sure we don't miss that um, because this, and Mike alluded to this, but just to put a finer point on this, this fund will be invested in 12 months. This is not a $10 million three-year fund. This is a $10 million 12 month fund. We have ample, ample deal flow to put this money to work. We will put it to work immediately. We have a, a number of investments that are ready. They're queued up and ready to go. So because we're investing this all in under 12 months or roughly 12 months, we're not going to do capital calls. It's just too short. It's too small amount of money. It's it, when people invest, we'll do it, you know, capital uh, within a reasonable period of time after the, uh, the, the definitive documents. And then we start investing. Right. Um, that's what I was going to We're actually uh, getting up to our time window. We want to hold anybody uh, on. Um, make sure you get your last questions in if you do have any additional. Um, with that, I'm just going to ask if uh, maybe Mike Raymer, if you have anything that you think we'd like to really uh, focus on in terms of, I don't know, what makes us different or like if you had to state our investment process in, you know, three sentences, I know that's almost impossible, but what, what is the differentiator that, that you really would say makes us unique? 
Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the quick statement that describes what we do is we don't just predict winners, we build winners. And uh, the picking winners is a highly refined process from, um, you know, a wide variety of startups that are vetted through the platform. Uh, so we have this great deal flow complemented by our ability also to build winners through the power of the network and the uh, general partners within the fund. So, you know, I would say the quickest way to say it is we don't just pick winners, we build winners. Well, I mean, that's almost a mic drop statement right there. Literally, it's a mic drop because it's Mike Raymer. Um, uh, so I couldn't think of a better way to end that. Um, I'm going to actually, uh, we, because we are, we're four minutes here left. I'm just going to give you a chance that uh, maybe, uh, Tobin, if you could just put my contact information back up from the slide deck. For those of you that don't have my email, this is available. Uh, you probably all should if you have the invites in front of you. But uh, I can put it in the chat too. I'll just put it in the chat. That's fine. Um, look, there it is. Um, if you have any questions or uh, anyone, any follow up, uh, inclusive of uh, wanting to come back and ask the uh, portfolio management team any questions, you can feel free to uh, funnel those through me. And I will make sure that those questions get answered. If you have any operational questions, that's definitely on me. And if uh, you would like more materials, just uh, let me know. Uh, we can send out uh, invites also to the Glassboard Network, which is our onboarding function, which allows you to do a direct investment. The minimum investment is $50,000. The retail window, that's the retail amount. That window closes for commitments by uh, February 15th. So we ask that you make that decision and uh, to let us know. After that, we are folk pivoting to uh, institutional investments where the minimum investment goes up to 250,000. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the doctors and the experts are part of the DNA of Angel MD. And so we're uh, giving that an opportunity to invest. <laughs> um, so with that, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks for the questions. Again, any questions that were not answered, feel free to email them to me. Take care, everyone, and have a good night.